So this afternoon, we have a, a panel. It's a panel in two parts. And during this panel, I plan to really frizzle your brains. Um, there have been a number of initiatives in Europe and in other countries, well, in Europe, uh, European initiatives and national initiatives. And I'd like to share these with you, um, partly to uh, give you inspiration and partly to continue to further the network that we have together. Uh, I'm Linda Hardman. Uh, I set up the IEUR working group a number of years ago, but I'll go into that in a minute. And I'm not timing myself. It's hard to speak and be a chair simultaneously. I'm now timing myself. Um, so the goals for today's uh, event are on the board behind me. So really, I want to give you a picture, a vision, a framework of what has happened in the past and why it has happened. All things come out of a certain context. And how the various networks that have been set up, how these fit together. And perhaps most importantly, how you can use this knowledge, these experiences, to either set up networks in your own country or connect existing networks in some way that are possibly unconnected so far. Um, and uh, think about how to have new initiatives, either the ones we're talking about or different initiatives, again, in your own country. I hope we have some interaction through the website. So if you have your laptops there, you can always type in questions. There will be time for questions after the various presentations. Um, but I really want us to really think on our feet about, OK, what is really good? What can we pick up? And how can we move forward? This is the scary side. This is just to let you see all the things we're going to do in these next few hours. Um, however, I will give you a readable slide in one moment. Don't worry about that. But firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Linda Hartman. And I chaired or founded the IEWR Working Group. So first, I will give the story of IEWR. And then I'll ask Rain Afer to give the story about ACM Women Europe. And I think these are slightly different networks with similar goals and different activities, just so you can compare the two. So I hope you can see the items on this particular slide. Um, I have 10 minutes to explain this, which is, should be fine. Um, first of all, I was, <laughs> I was visiting an ECSS conference in 2011, mainly because my own director didn't want to come because he's more of a mathematician than a computer scientist. And I went, OK, then, what is Informatics Europe? And it turned out that any member of Informatics Europe is allowed to attend the board meetings. And apparently, I was the first person in the history of the organization to actually say, please, can I attend a board meeting? And everyone's like, oh, someone attended the board meeting. And that evening, somebody said to me, would you be interested in becoming a member of the board? And I'm going, what? <laughs> so that'll teach me. Um, so I decided, I had two young kids, I didn't have time to do all this stuff. Until Cristina Pereira, uh, left on the bottom of the photograph here, she was the director, the executive director of Informatics Europe at the time, and she whispered in my ear that, you know, we need to do something for gender diversity in Europe. You know, there aren't enough women in computer science. We need to get more women. I'm going, yeah, you're right. She said, you could be on the board, you could do that. I'm going, okay, yes, you're right, okay. So I was basically arm twisted into taking on the task. And to be honest, it took me a year or so to really understand what I should be doing. Informatics Europe is an amazing organization because it has the heads of departments, of computer science departments across Europe. It's an extremely influential set of people to be able to talk to. And I also spoke to um, people in my own network who know, knew more about gender studies. I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I know nothing about gender studies and the fact that I'm a woman. I just go around being a computer scientist, oblivious to the fact that I'm potentially female. So after thinking about it and also discussing with Christina, we put together a booklet of best practices. Uh, an edited version is still available on the website, on the WAR website. And we distributed these amongst all the informatics departments in Europe. And one of these things that this booklet does is it has different um, potential activities one can undertake to increase the number of women at different levels in their career. In fact, corresponding to the three working groups in EU GAIN, one, two, three, from school to university, 
amongst university and then careers of academic women. So that's what happened there. And having basically finished the booklet, which I did, I won't say on my own, but I did it by myself being the center of the activity and talking to other people and getting the contributions, it was clear we needed to have a working group. And again, I looked to find representative uh, departments who knew things about um, increasing the number of women in the field. So we tried to get together a, a working group of experts. I mean, experts, you know, we still don't have equality in the field, so we're not done yet. But we put together our first working group and I'm very happy to say that after I left the chairing of the working group, that Jane Hilston took this over. And Jane Hilston introduced the Minerva Award. And I think Carlo Getz had once said to me, we need an award. And I'm going, yeah, what, what are you going to reward? Um, a good female PhD or something? But Jane got this much better sorted out and put together the award for a department. So the department is awarded for having good policy and one of the reasons the Minerva Award is set up the way it is, um, in that when you submit your application, you have to agree to have your application published on the website, which means that Informatics Europe now has, through the years of the award, a number of different best practices that are shown to be effective. Because when we set up the, or when we put together the booklet, these were recommendations from various sources, but there was no evidence for whether these actually worked. So with the Minerva Award, we're both rewarding a department for all the hard work they've put into increasing the number of women, and we're collecting the best practices which we can share in the community. And the next great thing that happened with uh, the WIRE working group, when it was chaired by Erika Abraham, is that she decided we need to get together, we need to talk to each other. So rather than just having the WIRE group, I know five or six or seven of us, and at the conference maybe 12 people who were interested, she thought we should have a real workshop. So she set up a workshop and invited a number of people to attend. And this worked very well. It meant there were, I think, one year, about 80 people in the room. And we were all talking about the topic and all exchanging ideas and learning from each other. And it was absolutely wonderful. And I became less involved with Informatics Europe as years move on. And then the next chair was uh, Letizia, who is our, still our current chair. And she has been amazing in taking on the EU gain um, cost action. So the cost action was applied for together with Informatics Europe with the goal to increase the activities we've done so far, to join things together, which means we're all having the meetings today and tomorrow. So I'm really, really yeah, thankful that this has been able to be possible and very, very grateful for all the hard work for all the different people put into these different networks. So it's not that EU gain is wire. It is not that wire is EU gain. But there's a definite connecting history. And I certainly hope that the EU gain will totally become uh, a, a, a golden swan flying away from the, the mother hen. The mother hen. <laughs> OK, so that was the, my uh, small anecdotes on the wire working group and how it moved into EU gain. And now we do a timetable that you actually can read. And in contrast with the Madrid timing, I'm now less late than I was when I started, so that's good. I would encourage you to, again, ask questions through the chat or live. I was first going to ask Rayan to contribute her um, experiences about ACM Women Europe, and then we can open the floor to the house for questions. So Rayan, are you with us, and can you talk to us? Yes, I'm here. Well, thank you so much, Rain, for joining us. I'm so, so grateful. And I mean, Rain and I have known each other for perhaps more years than I care to confess. Um, but she's always been a huge inspiration to me. And her kindness and her devotion to the field have been absolutely amazing. And her chocolates that she brings to meetings are also excellent. So she apologized profusely for not being able to bring them. So Rain, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. I also have been very inspired by you, your comments, and I learned a lot from you. Uh, it, it has it worked out very well, as you will follow my story here. 
Uh, I'm very honored to be with you today. I wish I was in there in person, but like, and I'm also very sorry that I had to step back from the EU game, which I loved and hugged, but it was very apparent that I would not be able to do what I really want to do together with all my volunteer work and new responsibilities. So I'm thankful to Letizia and the whole team, all amazing people uh, in the team. I'm thankful for their understanding. This uh, event is so valuable for me because this event is a dream becoming reality, maybe more than one dream to bring together people working for the same goal. So welcome to my living room corner where me and my husband have been working next to each other since the pandemic was announced. Uh, so I, my, I wanna share my ACM and ACMW and ACMW Europe experience uh, in a summary. Uh, so you all know as ACM Association for Computing Machinery is the oldest, widest, uh, premier organization of computer scientists, which was not very well known in Europe. Uh, so ACM established in 1947, the year after ENIAC, the first programmable general purpose computer, which was called giant brain by the press was uh, uh, introduced. Uh, and uh, a group of visionaries got together and said, we need to do something to advance computing as a science and profession. And the women you see in ENIAC photos were the computers when computers were humans and also the first programmers. Uh, ACM women took many years to get established. Uh, when the decrease, the shrinking pipeline uh, was uh, realized by um, many women and men also. So it was established in 1993 uh, to support, celebrate and advocate for women in computing. Uh, I had witnessed the decrease of female students uh, in my department. And I had an idea about the problem and I had an urge to do something. So I did a search and the first name I found uh, was uh, the director president of the Institute for Women and Technology. Anita Bork, to whom I sent an email. And she introduced me with ACMW, where they had started a project called the Ambassador Program. And I became the ambassador of my country and served for eight years uh, for ACMW. And then I had a break. In 2009, ACM established Europe, India, and China councils. And after three years, I was invited, I was an elected member of ACM Europe Council. And guess what happened at the first meeting? I jumped into the idea of establishing ACM W Europe. Uh, we had no idea. There was nothing uh, ongoing like that. Uh, but we said, okay, let's start small as a small enthusiastic focused uh, volunteers, which included Vicky Hansen, who's now CEO of ASEAN. And later on, Gabriele Kotzes joined us, who is now the president of ASEAN. I was very lucky to work with amazing people. And we also had great support from the headquarters. Uh, we decided on our target group first. Where should we start? K-12, undergraduate, graduate levels, early career level. And the decision was to start with women who are already wish for improving 
science. We were aware of the problems like lack of role models being the minority in the class, the need for belonging, loss of confidence, losing in. We were dreaming big, but we started with baby steps. Bring them together to inspire, to motivate, uh, to give them a chance to meet with role models uh, from industry, academia. Uh, and we were very careful about both geographic and field diversity also. So uh, we were Eva Navarro Lopez uh, and I was in a taxi and I was sketching the terms we were using to find a name. And I realized women ends with E-N and encourage starts with E-N. So women courage, we shouted together and women courage is a trademark now. It can be used anywhere in the world uh, to uh, have a celebration, bring together women. Uh, working with volunteers towards a goal was one of the most rewarding activities for me. Uh, of course, it has difficulties because your volunteers may have babies, health problems, increased responsibilities for the family members, get promoted, and th that is bringing more responsibilities, etc. Uh, while going through these, we learned working with volunteers requires healthy communication, clear, continuous, sincere, warm, friendly, listening and focusing to the solutions, not to the problem, well-defined roles and responsibilities, respect, understanding, patience, having plans B and C in case somebody cannot be able to do the tasks, so that giving them the chance to be relieved uh, about uh, themselves and not acting as the manager of an organization, but acting as a leader coach. So um, there are many, many things we learned from each other. 2012 is the year when Linda established IE Wire. And I think Carlo Gezi mentioned about uh, Linda. I think he introduced us and Linda jumped and we immediately started with a small memorandum of, of understanding to work together. Uh, Linda said, why, don't, why are we not our ex officio so that we can attend each other's meetings uh, as not non-voting uh, members? So we learned a lot from Informatics Europe and Informatics Europe helped us so much, especially for our first Women Courage, because that was the first. We had no idea how much attention that would take, how many people would attend. And we, we wanted it to be Europe-wide. So how could we reach out to young women who are in the field? And there was Linda who helped us to distribute uh, the information uh, to department heads who sent the information to the students. And in a very short time after we opened the registration, it was full. And we had many others waiting, waiting in the waiting list. So without Informatics Europe, we wouldn't be able to do that. And one of our goals was to bring together the many existing uh, grassroots and also formal organizations that, that are trying to uh, reach to the goal of increasing women in computing. Uh, and uh, WIRE did a great job by uh, informing uh, the websites of such uh, organizations. Uh, Chiquitas was one of them, for example, that I had heard about. And I'm sure Bara is among the uh, audience. And she, they were doing a great job. And she also was the chair of the Eighth Women Courage, which was a big success. 
So things are getting better, improving, reaching out is happening, and dreams are becoming realities. So what we should do now is to document what we have learned and pass over to our successors. One thing that needs to be done, what thing, one thing that worked very well uh, was an organization that allowed employees to spend a limited amount of time during their work hours who are working on an important issue like gender diversity. Yeah, for academics, um, it may seem more flexible time, actually it is not, but for uh, women in the industry, we really need to raise awareness about this. So if there are questions, I am very happy to share. Thank you very much indeed, Ray. A big round of applause for Ray. So I can open questions to the room. I can also open questions uh, to the Q&A on Zoom. And if you don't ask questions, I will. You have been warned. So one of my questions, uh, Rain, was um, one of the things I felt you did very well was to motivate the people in the group. Um, I'm, I'm very much a, I don't know which half of the brain it is, I'm very much a sort of logical person. And I do it like this and like that, and that's the way it goes. And you're, you're far more emotionally involved with the people around you. Um, can, can you explain some of the things you do to keep people motivated and, and still wanting to work on the job? <laughs> okay, and then I had another question. So when you were setting up the organization, um, was everyone, you don't have to name names here, but was everyone in the ACM Europe Council very positive about this? Or did you have to really persuade people that this would be a good idea? Actually, the chair was Oh, yeah. At that time. Everyone was positive. Okay, that's good. And Well, uh, I witnessed uh, what is happening, right. and they are taking the uh, fire. Yeah, I, I understand. And um, what I've also noticed in the organization, certainly in ACM Women Europe, is that because the women involved tended to be more junior, I could really see them grow in their roles. So. I, from my perspective, it was very much a good career move for them to be involved in these things. Is this something you noticed or you encouraged or was deliberate? Yes, uh, we never had the chance to, uh, to read personal impact of the record, but we were very happy to Oh, 
That's great. That's really great. Are there any questions from the room here? I'm not seeing any questions online. Yes, I see a question, Monique. You can pass the microphone. We're now passing a microphone to a question asker. If you can state your name Hi. and where you're from. Hello. We're now having microphone problems. Sorry, Ryan. Hi. Hi, Rayana Jam. <laughs> it's Rukia from Turkey. Uh, I just wanted to comment about the career in ACMW. Uh, actually, I started as an undergrad student, as a volunteer in the first women college in Manchester. I was just helping Bev with the supporters. And now I am ACMW Europe Vice Chair. So it's not a dream, <laughs> it's a reality. <laughs> Come and join us as a volunteer, then you will grow up with us. Thank <laughs> oh, you. That's great. Nice to see you there, Hojo. <laughs> that's lovely. Rain, you planted her in the audience, no? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Any more comments, questions? Okay, then I would like to thank Rain an enormous amount. Thank you so much, Rain. Thank you for all your work and thank you for your continued uh, uh, efforts for the cause. And I really hope to see you in real life as soon as we possibly can. Thanks. Okay. Um, now I hope that Anja Falk can join us from the Netherlands and perhaps also Alexander Silver from the UK. Yes, yes, I can hear voices. This is excellent. Um, so thank you very much indeed to Alexandra and Anya for joining. Um, they can tell you in a coffee break about the communication they had from me recently, so I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, however, <laughs> we, will, we are here. Uh, the reason I've asked Alexandra and Anya today is because they both run uh, coaching mentoring networks in their own subfield. And I felt it'd be really important for them to share their experiences about these networks with EU Gain. Again, as another example of the types of things you might want to replicate in your own field in this case. So this is international, um, but subfield specific of computer science. Um, I'm not sure if MD has an order for who goes first, but on my own piece of paper, it says Alexandra first. Is that okay? Thanks, Linda. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be able to join today and um, I wanted to, uh, to thank Linda for the invitation. Linda and I were actually in the same institute when I was a graduate student and she has had um, an impact on my career that uh, she might not be aware of. One practical thing I learned from Linda is how to format my CV. Uh, to be to be more uh, more visible to reviewers, and uh, I still use the tips that she gave me about twelve years ago. I think so. Um, so thanks, Linda, and thanks to Letizia and everyone in EU Gain. Um, I unfortunately had to step back from EU Gain, but it's a great initiative, and um, I, I really am looking forward to um, to hear about every all the cool stuff they do. Also, nice to see Gabrielle on the panel because what I'm going to talk about is on our subfield. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just a few minutes about the initiatives we have in SIG plan. So SIG plan is the ACM special interest group on programming languages. And for the last 10 years, so we celebrate this year the 10th anniversary of uh, PLMW, which is the programming languages mentoring workshop, which is a workshop that has been running in all the major conferences, it runs four times a year and uh, basically offers uh, undergraduate students, master students, and um, early PhD students an opportunity to network, uh, meet um, senior people in the field, and usually has a couple of technical talks, but mostly has uh, talks on soft skills and things like work-life balance, how to choose your advisor, um, how to do research, how to present your research, um, etc. cetera. Uh, during the pandemic, um, P 
PLMW had to go virtual, like most of our conferences, and very quickly became clear that um, it was not as effective as it had been in person. So around June 2020, um, a couple of us, and in particular Talia Ringer, who's now a professor at the University um, of Urbana-Champaign, uh, came up with the idea that we needed something else. And um, we started around that time a long-term mentoring program. And this is um, a program that matches mentors, senior uh, people in the field with um, younger people in the field that can also be assistant professors, can be faculty that are looking for some, some mentoring and starts a one-year relationship. So the idea is that the mentor and the mentee meet four or five times a year and each mentor has about two or three mentees and, and helps them out. And um, the main role of the people leading the program is to send reminders for people to, uh, to meet and to make sure that the relationships are indeed um, being fruitful uh, for both mentor and mentee. So if I can share my screen, I'll just show you what happened in one year of this program. I hope you can see my screen. Um, you, see a, you see a map um, which shows the countries where the mentors and mentees come from. Uh, and we have, so within one year, we have uh, recruited 225 mentors and we have 349 mentees in a one year uh, program. And they all come from 38 uh, countries. And on average, people have been um, meeting once every couple of months. Um, and we have been spending about an hour a month running um, the program. Talia, who is the chair. Uh, so we, we established this now as a proper program inside SIG plan. Talia, who is the chair, spends um, most of the time. Uh, I am the chair of the advisory board and we have an operations team um, with graduate students and, and postdocs and some assistant professors who um, help out running the logistics. So the logistics are not trivial um, and we are currently actually developing some software to help running this. But one thing we have um, learned recently uh, through surveys since the program has been running for a year is how much impact this has had on um, on people's careers, not only um, minorities, but, but also um, overall. So I think this has been a great success and I'm happy to, to answer questions on how, how we set it up um, and how we sort of now use this long-term mentoring program as a complement to the mentoring workshops that uh, will continue running, especially now from since last week, we actually went back to physical conferences. So there was um, one conference last week that had a physical uh, component and in January, we're gonna have a physical uh, popol, which is one of our four main conferences and there will be a physical PLMW uh, back, but the mentoring program is here to stay. So it started as a sort of pandemic uh, reaction and now it has become um, actually a big success and uh, we are very happy with it. So I'm happy to answer questions as well. So Alexandra, can you give us a few more words on how it was set up originally? Was this like one person had a bright idea or was there a group of you that got together? So how, how did it actually initiate? I think these so are- it's, it's actually, there's actually an interesting story behind that. So around the time of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, a bunch of fields organized a strike day and during that strike day, there was, so PL had a strike day um, in North America uh, and uh, a bunch of people uh, joined in and we read about, um, you know, things relevant to the Black Lives Matter movement. But there was also a subgroup in that um, day that actually talked about mentoring and how mentoring could have an impact on, um, you know, on the community. And that sort of started from there. And then around, so our next conference was in August. So that happened mid-June. Our next conference was in August. And so mid-July, Talia sort of said, you know what, we should just like do it. And, um, and somehow the general chair of the next conference was like, yeah, why not? It's a one more form on the registration. We asked people, do you wanna be a mentor? And so it started. and. It exploded in that conference, actually. We had um, 100 and something registrations. Talia put together a spreadsheet to try to manage it. We, at the moment, have like five spreadsheets we are, we are using to manage it. Um, and yeah, it's been, I mean, 
uh, kudos go to Talia, who actually pushed the idea in August when everyone was exhausted and not thinking about starting a new program. But then it started, and then a bunch of us jumped in to help. And um, yeah, it's been it's been a great a great success. Um, I saw one one question, if I may answer from the Q and A. You can sign up to be a mentor um, on the website. So on the website, if you go to seekplan.org, then there's a mentoring. A sub page and there there's a link that you can sign up to be a mentor and then someone asked about the gender balance across mentors and mentees um, many many men are involved uh, I don't have right the numbers um, of my cough but um, many many men are involved uh, so it is not the case that only women have signed up we have a lot of men who have signed up uh, my in instinct is to say that actually there's more men than women at the moment in the mentor pool Great, thank you very much. Um, do you have some time over? That's fine. I will now pass over to Anya and let uh, everyone else think of other questions either in the chat or we can do them live in a minute. Uh, Anya, would you like to tell us about your mentoring network, please? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Linda, for inviting me and thanks, Alexandra, for hearing your story. Um, so we have started a remote mentoring program way before the pandemic hit us. And it started in 2016. Perhaps a little bit about my own field. So I'm in the field of music information retrieval. That's an interdisciplinary field, though I would say the majority is really computer scientists, but we also have musicologists in it, or people from library science performers. And uh, we have annual conferences since 20 years, uh, so-called ISMIR. And the number of women in that field has always been around, or that attend the conference, probably 10 to 15%. Uh, so not a lot. And we also realized that uh, even those 10 to 15% are not really visible at the conference because for some reason, all the panelists are usually male and all the session chairs uh, used to be male. And so it was clear we need to do something on uh, first of all, increase the number of women, but also make those women that are in the field more visible. And so we had uh, informal uh, lunches actually, or breakfasts for the women uh, started in 2011. Uh, and we called it from the beginning, not only a meeting for the women, but for all the allies that want to help uh, to increase the career chances for women. And interestingly, we had, I think in every year, half of the attendees being male of that. So we never had a, a women only group. And I think it was in 2014 that we had the, uh, the, the breakfast, the informal breakfast at eight o'clock in the morning because that was like the only time slot, you know, which was still available. And then we had a male standing up and saying, you know, this is about inclusion. Eight o'clock in the morning is not really inclusive. Why is this not part of the official program? And we said, well, that's actually a very good idea. And so we asked for the next year, which was a, a, also the female general chair, hey, we, please, we want to have an official slot in the official uh, program that's called the Women in MIR meeting. And so that was our first plenary session. And we planned it right after a keynote so people couldn't leave. <laughs> so we had a full room. Uh, uh, discussing our issues of, you know, what can we do to increase the number of women? And we had a lot of also men in the audience, specifically from industry saying, you know, we are desperately searching for the women. Uh, so where are they? I said, well, that's great that you're also desperately searching. So we need to collaborate on that. And so one of the things that came out of this was how about establishing a mentoring program? That could be one task. And so the way we established that was basically after that uh, uh, discussion at, at the conference with everyone involved, we had three women working together. That was me from Utrecht University, uh, Blair Kaneshiro from Stanford University and Emilia Gomez uh, from uh, Spain, Barcelona. And we had, thank God, documents from our so I participated in a mentoring program at Utrecht University, and they were very willing to share all of the documentations, like how do you instruct mentors, right? So you need to start with documents. You can't just, it's otherwise uh, very difficult to, 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 to start from scratch. So we got a lot of um, 
uh, documents on what recommendations do you give to a mentor, what it means to be a good mentor. And then we simply started uh, in 2060 an online version of letting people via a mailing list sign up. We, we had a number of questions and then we would match the mentors and the mentees. And in the first year we had a trial round where we started with 20 mentors and 20 mentees. Uh, the next year we had 40 and the next year we had 80. So we have now a stable round of 80. So in total 160 people participating each year. And that means each of these pairs, they uh, get a period of six months where they uh, schedule with each other at least four sessions or four remote sessions. And they get a number of lists of to possible topics that they can talk about each other, but this is just an initial suggestion we give to them. For the rest, it's totally up to the mentee of what they want to discuss. Now, um, I think uh, I remember uh, in a private chat that the current uh, president of the ISMI told me, Anya, I think this initiative was one of the best things that our community has ever done. So um, it's a very appreciated program. Um, so we have usually two thirds of the mentors are from academia, one third is from industry. Um, so I have really heard very enthusiastic comments. And one of the things of keeping it running was that we still have this plenary session each year where people just tell about the experience. And I think it has inspired many people who were in the beginning, like, what do I have to do with that? They were just then sitting in the session and came up and said, well, that was so much fun. You just sign me up, please. Okay, so, so part was also, of course, always um, telling back what people get got out of that. And one very important lesson that I learned for me every year when I read just the feedback, what the mentees have gained and what the mentors have gained is one of the best days of the year for me because I learned what this has provided. And for the mentees, it's very often that they say, well, I know I'm in a minority, but I feel so much welcomed by this program and I get um, in my network and my mentor even connected me to other people. So I feel much better connected now than I was before. So they get a fee. It's really a help for them uh, for getting into the field. And the mentors, if they happen to be male, and we also have uh, at least half of them male, because yeah, we don't even would have that many uh, female mentors, they learn about the difficulties that their mentees approach that they didn't know about. So we got a lot of comments like, oh, you know, I had no idea that, you know, she has, I didn't, I didn't face these issues when, when I was uh, at her stage. So I think it really goes both ways that also the mentors learn a lot about the situation of women uh, or they get inspired by the research. Sometimes they end up running pro projects together. So it has uh, all kinds of um, different ramifications. And where we are now is indeed uh, the voluntary work that we talked about earlier, how do you remain that stable over the years? So we have each year a mentoring committee of four people. I mean, just imagining having to match 80 mentors and 80 mentees, right? That's a lot of work. And we are trying to uh, bring in new people, but still it's a question of how do you get the women power, men power to make this a sustainable uh, program and we also have men involved now in the in, even in the organizing I think half of our mentoring organizing team is is male which I think is very very important to get uh, the man part of the organization because it cannot be women for women and doing even more work right it's for women but it's for the entire society and at the moment we are also working on yeah how how do we establish that we always find someone who will run it the next coming years Okay. So perhaps I could Thank you stop much. at that point. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, I have some questions and I can ask my audience here if they have questions. There's also the questions in the chat. Um, but if no one raises the hand, then they get my questions. <coughs> um, so Alexander showed us a very nice slide with a, a formal structure with advisory board and chairs and things like that. Do you have such a, a formal organization or is it more informal in your case? No, we have. I mean, it, it, it used to be a bottom up initiative. So we just said, declared ourselves via the Women and MIR group and we collaborate with the board of ISMIR. So that's really a formal body where you have elections, you know, uh, every two years and who makes it into the board. And we do again uh, then ele or 
ask for volunteers of running this program every year. But that's exactly now the questions. Do we need to make it more formal? Do we need to elect people into these positions? And you know, what is the gain that they get by doing this? So we're exactly at this, at this question of, do we need to make this whole thing more formal? It, it came up as a bottom-up root movement, so to speak. And so far we always found volunteers, but that's exactly the question. Do we need to make it even more formal than we are now? It's certainly my impression is for sustainability. Yeah, it, exactly. It, it's a good idea and also, I mean, I've learned an awful lot from the ACM conferences. You have like past chairs and future chairs and things like that. So you get continuity as well as sustainability. Yeah. So yeah, my answer would be yes, but what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, the other point was, um, oh yeah, you mentioned a list of topics that you suggest that mentors talked about with their mentees or vice versa. Is that list public? Can we share it? Um, yes, I can. I can share that. I mean, it's just very general questions like, you know, in academia, work-life balance, whatever. It's not very specific, but, uh, you know, anyone who wants to, we're very happy also to share our sign-up forms. I think we have shared that already with other initiatives who started. So, so please contact me if anyone wants to have material. I'm happy to share. We relied on other initiatives and we are very happy to give whatever Google forms you might reuse um, um, yeah, please, please get in contact with me. And do, do you have a link to your initiative? Also, this book? Uh, yes, it's, uh, we have a, it's because me, WordPress .com. On the IEY uh, web pages, we do try to, okay, links to useful initiatives. And these are both extremely useful initiatives that we can learn. Yeah, I think, yes. So I, I can give you a, a link on that. So we have a blog, um, and all of the information should be available. And I have I mean, a, not. I have a question for the audience. Um, so these are two examples of mentoring networks and subfields. Is anyone else aware of other subfields which also have mentoring networks? I don't see any hands raised. I mean, I think you two are doing great work. I'm not sure if I can believe that you're the only two mentoring networks, but maybe no, I'm no. Can super I, good at finding them. Linda, I can add something. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, machine learning community has a very large um, mentoring, mentoring network. Um, Women in machine learning is a very, very successful workshop um, that has existed for many years and they have an informal mentoring network, but now they have started actually a formal mentoring network as well. Um, the computer architecture community has just started as well, um, a long term mentoring. And a lot of the ACM six are currently discussing also among themselves and, and looking at what we did and other people did and, and starting, um, starting mentoring networks. And the mentoring workshops also exist um, across the board at ACM, at least uh, in the ACM special interest groups. If you can share those other links with us as well, that'd be great. I will, I will put them on the chat. Uh, perhaps one more comment on, I think uh, on-site mentoring at a conference is also fantastic. I, I think one of the advantages of our remote uh, location is that we have uh, since two years now, mentees really from all continents, including Africa and South America. And I don't think we have managed to bring African uh, uh, researchers to the conference yet because of you know, all the money involved, but it's great to get them at least on board in, in these kind of remote settings. Perhaps just one extra thing about why sometimes also the remote mentoring can be a plus point. I agree, I agree. There is one network mentioned in the chat. Claudia Borg mentioned there is a field has a mentoring program under the Association for Computational Linguistics umbrella. So, thank you very much. It's good to know. We will remember that too. Okay, then if there are no more questions from the audience, then I'd like to thank uh, our panelists, Anya and Alexandra. And Anya, again, my communication wasn't brilliant. Are you able to join us later for a different topic or are you unavailable? Uh, what, 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 what do you mean by later? Later. After <laughs> the, we, we have a, 
a later session about wicks and uterus. Yes, you make it? That's... but but Gabriela can can that's talk fine. about this because I'm yeah, in fine. trouble with the time slot. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much for this contribution and thank you for all okay. your work in this. In the, you put a lot of energy into these uh, topics. I really really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Alexander too, of course. <laughs> I share Thanks university. very much, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Thanks okay. for the invitation. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay.